Lord, before we begin on this last of our lessons from the life of Moses, and I'm ending with this because um, it's communion today, communion Sunday, and I wanted to look at the Passover and how Jesus fulfills all the elements within it. And maybe you know some of this. I, <clears throat> When I first came to faith, I think it was only a Christian for a month up in Whitehorse, Yukon, way, way up there in the far north. Um, <laughs> A, a group came from Jews for Jesus and they did this amazing presentation on Christ in the Seder and how he, he fills that. I want, so I want to talk to you about that today. All right. It's the, it's the what? No. <laughs> now, this, the Passover meal or the Seder um, is what the Lord instituted through Moses for the people to do in remembrance of being saved from out of, of Egypt. It's a remembrance, he said, to Israel. But more importantly for us, um, it's how Jesus is embedded in the Seder. How even though, you know, this is a truth, even though most Jews don't, Jews don't recognize this truth and, and never have. First of all, if you don't know about the Seder, it, it is the traditional, traditional dinner celebrated again, by Jewish families in remembrance of the, the, the coming out of Egypt, that, that time, the Passover, on the 14th um, day of the Hebrew month, Nisan. Okay? And just to clarify, I'm going to go through a little bit of stuff here, and this is my opinion, and you can disagree with me if you want. That's okay, you can be wrong. Um, <laughs> it, that this day fell on a Thursday in the year that Jesus died. Okay, and was in fact the day that Jesus was crucified on this 14th of Nisan. Now it was on Wednesday that Jesus and his disciples had the Last Supper, that final meal together. Okay, now there's debate over this amongst all the smarty pants scholars, right? They, they debate this in and over and what days and oh, maybe no, no, that it was actually Tuesday that we had the Last Supper and then there was a break on Wednesday and then the there's the day of preparation, and et cetera, et cetera, right? So you take all of that with a, a grain of salt. But my point is that if the Last Supper was on Wednesday, it was not a Seder meal. Just technically, the Last Supper was not a Seder meal. And often it's represented as that. Now, John 13, 1 says it this way. And, and think about it. John was written later than the other Gospels. And I, I think uh, there's a little bit more accuracy here when he says, now, before the feast of the Passover. And so he says that they were meeting that night before the feast of the Passover, okay? And interestingly, though, the other Gospels tell essentially the same story about, you know, they say that Jesus says, okay, um, go and find this man and, and, uh, and tell him to prepare a place for me and get that place ready for the Passover, we are never expl explicitly told that they celebrated the Seder, okay? You know, I'm getting somewhere, don't worry. And then when those same Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, speak about uh, the bread that's used during the Last Supper, the word used is arctos, and which is Greek for normal leavened bread, which is interesting, right? So... Um, it's not uh, the word that's used, uh, matzah, for unleavened bread. Now, that doesn't mean that it can't be used in reference to bread generally, right? It could be, it could be done that way. But to even lend more weight to the idea that the Last Supper was celebrated on Wednesday is the fact that the first day of Passover is called a Sabbath, a high Sabbath, okay? A special Sabbath, Sabbath which, we begins, which began on Thursday at sunset. So you see, once a year, there are two Sabbaths together. There is the high Sabbath or the holy Sabbath um, of, of the day of Passover and the regular Sabbath, which begins Friday at sunset. All right, you're with me so far? All right. Now, the Jewish religious leaders wanted those who had been crucified on Thursday, in, including Jesus, to to be dead and come down off the cross, right, before sundown on that special Sabbath on Thursday. Okay. Clear as mud? All right. It's important because Jesus 
I want to get to this later. Jesus did not necessarily celebrate Seder with the apostles at the Last Supper, okay? And that doesn't mean that he didn't use references and inferences and, and things from, that, from the, the Seder in that meal. And we're going to circle back to that, okay? But I want to look at the order of the Seder because Seder actually means order. That the word means order. And how every aspect within it represents Jesus, some more so than others, definitely, but how it foreshadows Jesus and this atoning sacrifice and how most Jews didn't get this. And yet it was made for them. It was made for them to, to get it, okay? Now, the Seder has a specific order in which the food is eaten and the prayers are reheated, uh, recited and the hymns are, are sung. Um, and each Passover plate has a historical significance related to the Exodus, right? To the, to, the G, to the Jews and their freedom from slavery out of Egypt. And interestingly, um, 1 Corinthians 5, 7 identifies Jesus Christ as our Passover. And I don't think truer words can be spoken than that. Jesus Christ is our Passover. The thing of it is, Seder always pointed to Jesus and his atoning sacrifice. It always did. It always pointed to the Messiah. So, okay, the first reference to the Seder to Jesus is the shank bone of a lamb. How do we do, Cynthia? Oh, look at that. I, I always get Cynthia to try to find me these pictures. So, And this reminds those who are partaking in Seder of God's salvation, right? So you remember the 10th the plague um, when all of the firstborn were going to be killed. And, and uh, the, the Lord, the angel spoke and said to Moses, tell all the Jews to take hyssop, the blood of a lamb, sacrifice a lamb, take the blood, you sit the painted on the doorposts and the, the lintel and their homes, and the Lord would pass over them, and the firstborn would not die. So this is a picture of salvation in Egypt, but also a picture of Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, right? John 1, 29. And the Jews were instructed that the Lamb's bones could not be broken, right? Yet again, foreshadowing Christ's death on the cross. Now, I think the next and the most powerful picture of Christ in the Seder is in the matzah, or the unleavened bread. The, the people commemorated the fact that they had to leave Egypt in haste, right? They didn't even have time to, to let bread rise, to make leavened bread. And so um, they had unleavened bread. And so the Passover is followed by this week-long feast called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And... Uh, when I grew up, we were actually in a, uh, the Garner Ted Armstrong Worldwide Church of God from Pasadena, California. I don't know how many of you ever heard of that. And uh, we would actually have to remove all leaven from our house before Passover and that week. And, and it was a real serious business, right? And uh, it was interesting that as Christians or quasi-Christians, um, they were so focused on uh, the Old Testament and those things. But that's another story. Um, but I remember that. I remember having to, to do that ritual and to go through those things. So the, this, there is some really super cool things, things here I want to show you in the preparation and serving of matzah and the Seder meal. There is a bag that the matzah goes into, okay? And it is called an ichat, and which essentially means one flesh. And it has three chambers, okay? So one piece of matzah is placed in the top cham chamber and it's never touched, never seen, right? Never used. It's hidden there, left there. The second matzah is broken in half at the beginning of the Seder meal and one ha half is placed back in the bag, okay? The next half is wrapped in linen and it's called an apikomen. And then the third matzah is used to eat the elements of the Seder meal with, all right? And now that word ichad, the name of the bag implies a close unity of one, 
And the reference is used, the other way, place that used, the word is used, is a, between a husband and a wife. Or if you remember when they came back from searching out the, the promised land and they came back with a huge cluster of grapes, a unity in one. That's what that word represents. And many Jews believe that the three matzahs represent Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but they cannot explain why Isaac is broken and half is put in and half is left out in linen. They, they have no idea why this is. You think after a couple thousand years they can get it or more. Of course, the New Testament explains this riddle of what the matzah represents and it's a picture of the Trinity. It's this beautiful picture of the Trinity. The first matzah represents the Father, right? Who is not touched or seen. And the third matzah represents the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. That is the matzah that we eat. And the second matzah the broken one represents the sun. The middle matzah is broken because it pictures the broken body of Christ. The half put back in represents the divine nature of Christ. And the half that is left out represents his humanity, Jesus' humanity and his time on earth. And the linen cloth represents Jesus' burial. And that during Seder, this cloth is hidden. And then after dinner, the children must go and search it out, must go and look for it. Then after it is found, it is held for ransom. Isn't that so cool? And again, these symbols and rituals point directly to Christ, right? That Jesus was fully God and fully human, that he was broken. His body was broken for us, that he was buried, sought for and that his life was ransomed for many. And I just think it's such an amazing picture that God made within the matzah to reveal to the Jewish people what was happening. Now, the matzah was also prepared in a certain way. Of course, it was unleavened, right? Um, and leaven is often equated with sin in the scriptures. And Jesus, of course, was sinless. And the matzah must be striped. And Jesus stripes, his wounds are what heal us spiritually. And also the matzah must be pierced. And of course, Jesus was nailed to the cross. So all of these things point just completely and directly to Jesus Christ. You know, so in the matzah alone, you can see Jesus is, is prophesied and remembered, even though most Jews don't understand this truth. Okay, and the, these next elements, and then they're not so full and rich in the in the in Christ as the rest, but there's always a reference there. And the next element in the Seder is karpas, and it's a vegetable, usually parsley, and it's dipped in salt water and then eaten. And the karpas is a picture of the hyssop that was used to apply the blood of the lamb on the Israelites' houses. And in the New Testament. His support was used to give the Lord, to give him drink, right? Give him vinegar when he was on the cross. Okay, the next is maror, or bitter herbs. And usually in modern times, they use horseradish, one of the most bitter of herbs. And this was used to remind the Jews that they couldn't offer sacrifice and worship to God. And this was more bitter to them even than their slavery to Egypt that they were forbidden or kept from worshiping their Lord. The next is Haroseth or ch Charaset, which was a mixture of apple, nuts, wine, and spices. And it represents the mortar, remember that the Israelites had to make um, in order to make the construction of buildings in Egypt. And one of, it's one of the only elements of the Seder meal that is sweet, and it's a reminder of the hope of redemption that we hold. Then came bayatza. It's a hard boiled or roasted egg. And this, these eggs were traditionally eaten by mourners. And the egg is eaten at Seder to remind those participating that they're always in mourning for the loss of the temple. So this came about after the, the first temple was destroyed. <clears throat> 
and, and to remind them of that. In fact, the egg that is roasted reminds them of the roasting of the, of the sacrifice on the altar before the Lord. And finally, there are four cups of wine used at various points during the Seder, and each has a name. The first is the cup of sanctification. The second is the cup of judgment. The third is the cup of redemption. And the fourth is the cup of praise. And, you know, whether Jesus celebrated, whether it was a Seder meal that he celebrated at the Last Supper or not, um, these cups of wine do have significance in, in what he instituted in the Last Supper. And then this final note on the Seder. Just think of this. In Exodus 6, 6, the Lord promises people he would save them from out of Egypt and slavery. And you hear throughout the scriptures, you hear Father God say in the Old Testament, oh, repeatedly he used these words, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Right? Isn't it more ministering, don't you think, that we are saved from slavery to sin and death by Jesus? Outstretched arms. So, you know, here you have the entire Seder is a picture of the redemptive work of Christ and his love of God and for his children. All right, so we, before we go into communion, um, let's just take a moment in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this picture. Uh, more than that, this, this truth of how you revealed your son, Jesus Christ, even in the institution of this Seder meal long before he came. And uh, we thank you so much that there's such vivid, vivid truth here. And it just gives us hope and, and understanding again, once again, that your word is true and that you have spoken things far in advance to show us uh, that you are the creator God who knows all things and reveals all things. And so we, we just ask, um, Lord, that you continue to reveal your word and your very person and your nature and your love to us in our hearts. And as we come forward in this time for communion, oh Lord, I ask that you would uh, bring us that peace that surpasses understanding and prepare us to partake in the bread and the cup together. Amen. All right, I'm going to come forward. And if uh, actually, if you guys could wait a bit, it's going to take me a moment. Yeah, Mark, actually, could you come down and help me move the table? Just out a little bit. All right, thank you. Actually, you could have a seat for a little while. This is going to take a moment. You know, again, Jesus had this meal together on the night. Uh, it's called the night that he was betrayed, right? That he had this meal together. Now, even if it wasn't a Seder, it doesn't mean that Jesus didn't allude to these very powerful truths that are within the Seder meal. And remember, Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath, even over the Sabbath, right? You think about the fact that he is part of the Trinity. He created all things. He made all things in heaven and earth, and he's not bound by any of anything. And again, there are two Sabbaths, right? We have the high or the holy Sabbath on the first day of Passover, the 14th of Nisan. And then we have our, our week, the weekly Sabbath, which began um, Friday evening at sunset. So Jesus, having been captured on Wednesday evening, um, taken in secret, you know, captured in the Garden of Gethsemane, taken in secret in the dark to the, the council, if you like, before the Jews, and then to go before Pilate, and then taken to the cross. And remember that the Roman guards were instructed by the Jews through Pilate to go and make sure that they were dead. And when they got there to break their legs, isn't that a wonderful thing? So they would die quicker. Jesus had already passed. And this was to fulfill the prophecy that his leg, not a bone would be broken, that he truly was the lamb of God who took away the sin of the world. And the Romans always, you know, it's interesting that they did this at the behest of the Jews, even the crucifixion so many ways and Jesus was in the tomb three days and three nights so Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night he was in the tomb and he rose on Sunday and all this 
is in keeping with prophecy. It proves that Jesus is the Messiah. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about the Seder meal again, is we see the truth of Jesus Christ as the Messiah within it. And during this last meal, this last supper, Jesus used elements of the Seder, of this special remembrance of salvation for all people. And I think he did this because he wanted this last meal to have great significance. It's interesting that you, you normally celebrate the Seder with family, but he celebrated it with the apostles. And again, this is a picture of us, of the church, of Jesus celebrating with his church, with the bride. And it's so interesting that in Jesus, the Passover was no longer about something historical, something that God had done, but what God was going to do in Jesus Christ in that next day, what he would accomplish in him. The bread, which is broken, represents Christ's body, which was broken for us. And it's interesting that um, it's seen in the matzah, the broken matzah, and yet the Jews didn't understand. The glass of wine that Jesus held up was the cup of redemption that's mentioned in the Seder, right? And he says explicitly that this cup is poured out for you in the new covenant in my blood. And then, and all of this, Jesus pointed to the Seder and showed how he fulfilled it. He was the unblemished lamb, sacrificed, right, for all of us, for our sin, that we might have life and life eternal. He was the bread, the body that was broken on the cross for us. He was the redemptive one, the one whose blood was shed for our redemption, that we would have life and life eternal. All right, before we uh, begin with um, communion, I'd just like to remind you that we are serving it in two cups. Um, the, the wine is stacked upon the cracker that's underneath, which is gluten-free. If, so if you have that kind of allergy or problem, you don't have to worry. You can partake in the bread. Um, it may not be the tastiest of little and old, but we can all partake together, right? Think of it as a bitter herb. <laughs> no. Um, and so I just want to remember that. And I also want to remind you um, that if you have not accepted Jesus Christ into your heart, if, his, if your life has not been devoted to him, and you, and you understand that truth and you're still seeking to know him, then I would ask you to pass on uh, the elements, the bread and the cup, and then to just use that opportunity to ask yourself, what, why have I not accepted Christ in my life? What is holding me back? Um, what is stopping me from that? Uh, because if you're here, obviously you're being drawn here and, and, and the Lord is calling you out and, and calling to you and, and desiring that you come to know his love and his mercy and his grace and his son. And so let's just take a moment because we part of the, the point of communion is that we come before the Lord and we are clear, if you like. We are clean. We have nothing against one another. We don't hold anything against our brother and sister. And he says, if you do, then go quickly, right? And, and take care of that business before you come to the Lord's table and partake together. And it's not just that. If there's anything in our lives that might be holding us back, um, between us and the Lord, it's the time to take and, and do that confession before the Lord. Because he says he is faithful and just to forgive your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So let's just take a moment before the Lord, before we begin. Vincent, would you please come up? And Mark, and Terry, thank you. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we can come together in this way. It is the, the blessing and is the privilege of the body, your bride, that we can come together and celebrate um, this Passover, if you like. I love those words in the scriptures that you are our Passover, that it is you 
who redeems us. This is the price that you paid as the precious lamb, the sinless lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And so we come to celebrate that today. We come to remember, uh, memorial you, to remember you. And we do this because uh, not just that you instituted it, because it's in our heart and because it draws us close to you. And it draws us close to each other because we don't do this alone. We do this in your name and we do this together as the body of Christ. And so we lift this time up to you, Lord Jesus. And we praise you and we thank you. Amen.